Uh, we are going to continue the talk, and now the second part of the talk is about the principles of the formation of Christ. Actually, these are the practical steps in, in, in a sense. There are five principles. Number one, the assurance of salvation. And number two, working out our salvation, means of the grace or means of the grace. Number three, the seasons of salvation and the divine calendar. Number four, the city of the soul. We, have, uh, we are already praying the statements of the prophesying statements about the city of the soul. The city of the soul and the city of God. And number five, sp spiritual fatherhood and sanctifying pouring of the Holy Spirit. Let me go over those again. So number one, the assurance of salvation. These are five principles related to the formation of Christ, mean, practical means. So the assurance of salvation, the working out of our salvation, that is the means of grace. The, number three, the seasons of salvation and the divine calendar. That's referring to the church calendar, the divine calendar there. Number four, the city of the soul or the city of the self and the city of God. And number five, the spiritual fatherhood and sanctifying pourings of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, to begin with, there is an important point. Take heed. We need all these principles together. We are all familiar with the means of grace, which are prayer, repentance, word of God, fasting, ministry. These are the means of grace. Uh, we are all familiar with these means as, as, the means that, as means that help us in the process of spiritual growth. In fact, focusing on one principle only, like means of grace, with which you are quite familiar, does not help despite of their importance. The means of grace can help the person to establish a step that has already been taken, but it does not help the person to move from one level to the other. We got so used to moving in one spiritual level back and forth, but we fail to move from one dimension of the spirit to another. We often complain that we have ups and downs in the spiritual life and cannot break through despite practicing all the means of grace. This is actually because the means of grace, taking them separate from other principles, cannot help the person to step up from one point to the other. There are, there, there are, there are other things that can help in this stepping forward. They are actually the steps that help in the formation of Christ. And as a result, this formation, the per, as a result of this formation, the person can move from one level to the other. Each step the person takes needs to be established, and this requires the means of grace. Is this clear? Yes. <coughs> I, okay, this is, <laughs> this is at risk of, this is at risk of oversimplification, but I'm still going to say this a little bit. Uh, for those of you in this century who have ever played a computer game, okay, you, you start at one level and you know how to do certain things, right? But unless you know how to move to the next level by perhaps in a computer game defeating what is called the big boss, um, you stick in that level until you figure out how to do that. And then you move on to the next level. And if you've really understood the previous level, you're, uh, it's been established. You don't ever really quite fall back to that, that level. But what the early fathers are saying is you can't just rely on one particular or, or just a few types of like the means of grace. It has to be an integrated whole in order to keep moving in your spiritual progression. Right. Is that okay? Do you play games with a computer? I don't know. <laughs> 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 Occasionally, but no. <laughs> there's a confession. I <laughs> <laughs> of course, I think I think we already agreeing from yesterday that you are going to hear something unusual and unfamiliar, and if it is not pleasant for you, just. Just forget about it. But, so this means that throughout the centuries, this means 
Throughout the centuries, the devil succeeded to steal from the Church of Christ all her riches, leaving her with one point only, which he, which he knows will not have a big effect, and hence people will remain under his dominion. There is a true desire in God's heart to restore these principles to his church. He also desires that there would be a restoration for this theft or stealing. If this spiritual stealing is not dealt with, the person will not be able to have a true and full understanding of these truths, even if they are well explained. This is because when the devil did this stealing as a result of the negligence of the church in certain centuries, he formed a layer or a cover of darkness around the mind, which causes hindrance in understanding these truths, like a veil, like Paul speaks about the veil in 2 Corinthians 3. I may hear these truths and feel I almost understand them, yet I cannot do anything further. This is because there is a veil which opposes the formation of Christ in us. Therefore, God desires to find people who can re realize this matter and know how to deal with it according to the Bible. In Isaiah 42:22, it is written, but this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. They are for prey, and no one delivers, for plunder, and no one says, Restore. This was in the old... Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is the verse. It speaks about, about nobody say, Restore. This was in the Old Testament about the old Israel. The same is happening with the new Israel. It is the devil's plan against God's people throughout history from age to age. Yet, the counter plan of God is to find people who would stand in the spirit and say, restore what was plundered and looted. As a result, the devil releases his imprisonment and the veils that are covering the mind would fall down. The mind would, be then, uh, the mind would, would then be opened to the spiritual understanding and the spirit would experience deep hunger. One of God's economists of the end times is, is times of restoration of all things, as written in Acts 3.21. Okay, times of restoration <laughs> of all things is one of God's economies in the end times, as in Acts 3.21. God's restoration of all things. Now, the first principle, assurance of salvation. You should be familiar with this, but I hope that you are not going to uh, be unhappy with some of the things I'm going to share with you about the same principle. Assurance of salvation. This is a familiar term, which is talked about very frequently, especially in the Western part of the church. Assurance of salvation depends on clarifying biblical truth related to salvation and presenting them to the believers. These verses speak about salvation as something assured because it is an internal salvation. Hebrews 5.9. Can, can anyone read these verses not here? Hebrews 5.9 and 9.12. Hebrews, Hebrews 5.9 5, 9 and Hebrews 9.12. Can someone read that? And has he been perfected? He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 9.12. 9.12. Nine, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So it is eternal salvation, it is eternal redemption. But the way it is presented in the Western Church of the, of the, of the Western part of the church, forgive me, <laughs> is always presenting the verses so that it will be like the defense against doubts. But this usually never works uh, because doubts will come again. So this is the point, because they actually in the Irish church they have something else to add. <clears throat> However, what has happened in history is that many believers who knew the truth about assurance of salvation, their minds will filled with them and they believe them. Yet, because of certain recurring sins in their lives, they start to doubt and lose this assurance. Do you experience this or only the Egyptians? <laughs> <laughs> The assurance of salvation is a foundation, is a foundation in which all the truths of salvation and working out of salvation are based. 
In talking about the working out of salvation, the early fathers of the church used the well-known biblical picture about a house being built in the soul. Jesus uh, used this illustration, who built a house on rock or on sand. Do you remember? <clears throat> so uh, they uh, used this uh, biblical picture about a house being built in the soul. Paul talks about himself as wise master builder. There are also many references that talk about inner spiritual building. You can write some of them and look at them later. Acts 9.31, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, and Jude 20. And Jude 20. Accordingly, the foundation of the inner spiritual building is the assurance of salvation and completion of this building is the working out of salvation, the formation of Christ. Do you see? There's a foundation and then built up. The foundation is the assurance of salvation, the foundation of the building, and then the completion of the building or the building it up is the formation of Christ. We notice how Paul said, you are God's field, you are God's building. So, in the early church thinking, there are three parallel pictures about salvation in the Bible. <clears throat> it can be a baby in the mother's womb, can be a building being built and goes higher inside the inner man, or can be a seed where there is life and then it erupts and a living tree comes out, which is the tree of life, Jesus in me. Okay, so three parallel <laughs> pictures, a baby in the mother's womb, a building being built up and it's going higher, or a seed and a tree emerges from that seed, the tree of life, which is Jesus. So the outcome of every picture is always about Jesus, always about Jesus being in me. The baby in womb's mother, Jesus is formed in me. The building turns me to be a temple of God where Jesus dwells, 1 first, first Corinthians 3.16, I think you are familiar 1 Corinthians 3.16. Yeah. And the seed in field, Jesus is formed in me as the tree of life, Revelation 22.2. The early fathers didn't like the assurance that only comes from the verses that prove it, because they knew that there can come a time of spiritual warfare or spiritual weakness, and the person cannot doubt, and the person can doubt this assurance. According to them, this assurance is a realiz realization based on what happens inside the soul by <coughs> salvation. When the mind is filled with the truth, and special battle starts, the mind may be covered and may not able to remember these, ver truths, these, these verses. However, if the eyes have been opened and know what has happening, what has happened inside and what Christ has done, even if the old sins come out, one will not be moved from this assurance. So if these truths are only in the mind, in the time of spiritual battle and attack, the mind can be clouded and confused and lose the truth. But if the spiritual eyes have been opened, then they know what has happened inside already. And even if old sins come, they'll not be moved from this assurance that uh, I am in Christ and Christ is in me. And because of this, Jesus, when he, after resurrection, after resurrection, opened the eyes of, and the mind of his disciples. Please read these verses, not here. Luke 24, 31 and 45. Luke 24, verse 31 and verse 45. Can anyone read, please? Luke 24, verse 31 and verse 45. Their eyes were opened. Next verse. And verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He opened their minds. <clears throat> we need to understand this full truth that helped them understand the assurance of salvation. It is very simple. Two conditions resulted from the fall. A judicial problem and a health condition. A judicial problem and a health condition. This understanding is based on the two main Greek words used by Paul to describe this issue of salvation. One of them was used only in the courts as Paul at Paul's time, and the other was used only in the medical circles. 
<coughs> these words were then translated justification and sanctification. Justification and sanctification. The early church fathers saw these two problems, the judicial and the health problems, as a parallel, as parallel, a separation or cutting off in the relationship between man and God took place by the fall <coughs> because <coughs> man, <coughs> man broke the commandment and became under judgment. As a result, man lost his communication and connection with the source of life and light and hence became full of darkness and died. This is the outside condition between man and God. When Christ came, he took sin, judgment, and condemnation away, and we were justified. This justification consequently, this is justification. <coughs> Can I just pause? <coughs> so um, the fall resulted in a, in a separation, a, a, a rupturing of the relationship between man and God, which cut off then the access to the source of life and light, and so man became full of darkness and died. And this uh, judgment and, and, and condemnation have been taken away by the process which we call justification. And that's a word that comes specifically from the legal process, the court of the time. Consequently, the current of life and light was restored. The person thus moved from death to life, from darkness to light. He realized that he has become a son of God, that he has heavenly inheritance, that the Spirit of God dwells in him, and that he has all the privileges of salvation. According to the early church teaching, a similar parallel case took place inside man. Corruption came in the inner man. When justification takes place and condemnation is lifted up, all the blessings are granted, yet the state of corruption is still potent inside the person and requires a special dealing. This dealing has actually been accomplished in the cross. However, as is well known with all special truths, the person has to understand them and receive them. Lack of understanding of this point makes the person saved in the sense that he is justified, yet the inner corruption remains inside because another step should, be t should take place. Christ has granted us healing and wholesomeness. Okay. wholesomeness. Let me pause here. So we're talking about two parallel tracks, justification, sanctification. And right now we're talking about the, the health, the term used in, in health, sanctification. And because of the corruption which is in, inside in man's um, <clears throat> soul, um, that corruption is addressed as we gain the understanding and the work of the cross and the work of the cross in 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 the person healing and wholeness is restored so Jesus lifted up the condemnation and also he has he also healed the corruption he lifted the condemnation he healed the corruption <clears throat> Uh, and we read in 1 Peter 2.24, I think you are familiar with this verse, but we usually use it for the healing of the body, but it's also for the healing of everything. <laughs> 1 Peter 2.24, <clears throat> who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This is not just a promise for healing for the body, but also for the healing of inner man, for the inner corruption. So justification is a gift from God. The person only receives it because a dead person cannot do anything. He just receives life. That's why it is written, by grace you are saved, by faith it is not from you. However, after that, the person is already alive, so he can do something. He can draw near to the life of Christ, which, is, which the Holy Spirit transfers to us. What is this life of Christ? It is his redemptive work, namely his crucifixion and resurrection. When the Holy Spirit transfers to me the death and the resurrection of Christ, his death takes away the corruption while his resurrection transfers life, the life that carries inner healing and wholesomeness. 
Analyse. So his death takes away the corruption, while his resurrection transfers the life. As a result, I am justified, I am also healed. I am justified from condemnation of sin, and I am healed from the poison of the old serpent, the wound of sin. This is the assurance of faith and salvation. Again, in every spiritual exercise, the prayer, repentance, my, the goal is to connect with his redemptive work, where the Holy Spirit transfers to the person the death and the resurrection of Christ. This is very important. We must remember that whenever we pray any prayer or, or read the word of God or do anything about what's called means of grace or, or special disciplines or whatever, we must put in mind that we are connecting with the cross and receiving the two sides of the cross, death and resurrection. So death will, will put my old man into, into death and the resurrection will in, enrich, increase, empower the new man so I can grow in, in spirit really. This understanding and realization of how much Christ has done for us enlightens us and puts in us a sense of spiritual indebtedness. Spiritual indebtedness. This indebtedness to Christ is the strongest base for this assurance. Even if any old sin comes out, it wouldn't cause me to doubt because my eye is now open to what has happened outside me and inside me. The early fathers used to explain to their spiritual children how this inner healing happens because it is very important. Our problem today is that we think that this spiritual healing is an experience that takes place at a particular point of time. I'm here still talking about the healing of salvation in general, not about the healing of the soul, which is the inner healing. Because we do not see the inner part, and we can only see the outside part. We think that this healing can happen at a particular point of time. Healing is a process that needs time. Like any wound in the flesh, no matter how much medicine you put on it, it can never heal in one day. Actually, the wound starts to heal from side to side, but the middle will still be open. Then it starts to heal more and more until all of it is healed and closed. The point is that because only the two edges are healed and the middle is still open, then the, the enemy can take advantage of this and come and, and, and tempt me and I fall and think, oh, nothing has happened. I'm the same like, like, like before. So am I uh, saved? I'm not, because I have no understand what was going inside me. I didn't understand the wound of the sin, of the original sin, and how it gets healed first from the edges and then continue and it's completely filled. Then I'm really released, I'm really free. Now, before I go to the second principle, I'd like to uh, speak again about the most important terms, justification, sanctification, and cleansing. Justification, sanctification, cleansing, three terms. Justification, as mentioned now, is a solution of the judicial problem. It includes three components. Uh, through all my life, in the books I read, in the people I heard, I have never heard this. But this one of the things the Lord showed me during my seclusion time is very important. I hope I can, I can bring them to you in a clear way. Three components of justification. <clears throat> the first component, it sets us free from the penalty of death. This is very common. Every one of you, of course, knows this. Do you? <laughs> <clears throat> so it sits, uh, this is the first component. It sits us free from the penalty of death. Let us read 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 5, 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Romans 4.25. Romans 4.25. Who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So this is the first component. The second one, it brings us to a position of being completely free from the accusation 
as if we have never sinned. This is a missing point usually. So not only does it set us free from the penalty of death, it also brings us to a position of being completely free from the accusations as if we've never sinned. I try to explain it more. I try to give an illustration. God help me, please. But remember, uh, imagine uh, uh, a person uh, stole some amount of money and he was imprisoned. Then a kind man came. Uh, of course, uh, legal things do not go this way, but imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> a kind man came and said that I'm going to pay for, for, for the money that was stolen and please let this person uh, be released. All right? Then he was released. Then, of course, he knows this thief from where he got this stealing, some person in some area. So try also to avoid going there. Because he now is free. He has, like, the, the document of the court. He is free. Nobody has any charge against him. But he knows that his conscience is under the condemnation of what he has done. And if he saw the person from whom he is told is coming from, from that point, he will try to find another point. He has some shame inside and some sense of guilt inside, right? It is the same with, with us in the spirit. This is the, this is the great thing in, in justification. The Lord knows that we are free because he was crucified for us. But he knows also that the devil will come to one, one of us and say that, oh, you know, you are a believer, you are free, but remember your Adam, your father? Mm. I, have, I, I succeeded to make him fall. I still have something against you. You, you are in Adam. So I, I, uh, I was able to, to conquer your uh, grandfather, so to speak, something like this. Mm. And so Jesus dealt with it completely and justification. But how? You have to ask me how. how? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You are very attentive, wonderful. <laughs> uh, it is all because he actually implanted us, implanted us in, in him. We are implanted in second Adam. No more related to our father, Adam, first Adam. So the enemy can't have any claim on us or to put shame on us being related to first Adam, whom he had defeated. When the Satan comes to me, I said, Oh, you have been an Adam. Who is Adam? I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> so we're completely free from accusation by the process of being implanted in Christ himself and being completely free from the, the first Adam. So I have two references here so we can uh, see them. Romans 5, 18 and 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to a condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. That was Romans 5, 18 and 19. And also 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. I think it's clear from the biblical references. Now the third component is, it in, it in, sorry, any question? No. No, number C, they said number the command, it, it installs the righteousness of Jesus' life into our lives. This is a very important point, again, which many times is, is, uh, is missing. It installs the righteousness of Jesus' life into ours. Uh, uh, because, let us read first, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is a very important point. Just hear what I'm going to share now. The main request of God from man is to walk in righteousness. This is the main thing, the main thread through all Old, Test Old Testament commandments. The main request of God from man is to walk in righteousness. Righteousness simply means walking in straightness with God. God is straight, and he wants us to be straight. When the fall took place, man became unable to walk straight and began to walk in his crooked ways. As it in Isaiah 53, 6, you are familiar with it, of course. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all. God gave us the commandments as crutches to help us to help our weak community to walk straight and right. Commandments are not a burden, are not something that you have to do and not to do. It is just crutches to help us. Paul explains wonderful thing about this in Galatians, not the time to go to there. But there, there are crushes to help our weak humanity to walk straight and right. This is the real purpose of God's commandments. They are not intended as a burden, does and does not. They, but man, in his fallen nature, turned the, condom, the commandments to be a burden, and he began to be afraid of God and walk at a distance from him. And Romans, can you help me? This? <laughs> my, my voice is, is yeah. weak, and he helps me a lot. <coughs> but, uh, uh, but he must stop uh, playing, playing games so that he can mm. help more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if a couple of you just pray for our voices, because suddenly both of us are having a little bit of the frog in our throat. So um, Romans... Uh, 7, seven 11 to 13. Romans 7, 11 to 13. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. And another, uh, another, uh, this is Deuteronomy 10, verse 13. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. The commandments are for our good. The commandments are for our good. And Deuteronomy 30, verses 6 and 14. Deuteronomy 30, 6 and 14. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. Uh, of course, uh, you, the, the last uh, verses, if you are going to think of it a, a little, you can, it, is, it is like a, a language of New Testament and not Old Testament. They're covering the heart. The word, this is what Paul quotes in Romans 10. In Romans 10, verses 8 and 9. Romans 10, 8 and 9. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So actually, whatever we are, we are, we are able to do, we will never be able to live righteousness right with God. But Jesus imparted his life, all life in us, and his life is so righteous, so he enabled us to really be righteous through his impartation of his own life. This part of justification. These are the three parts of justification. Now, sanctification. The ultimate purpose of sanctification is transformation, to be conformed to the image of his son, as written in Romans 8.29. Romans 8.29, to be conformed to the image of his son. And of course, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. You know for these verses. It is an important process which needs to be taken diligently. And we read it in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. I like these verses. Mm, Philippians 3, 12 and 14. This is an indication of the important process that needs to be taken diligently. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, 
I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we need to understand the important fact related to sanctification. We have two biblical truths that complete one another. Christ died for us. We died with Christ. And you can easily memorize the references because it's Romans 5, 8 and Romans 6, 8. So it is easy. So Christ died for us. We died with Christ. Romans 5, 8, the first. Romans 6, 8. So next. just a few words about this. Uh, God demonstrates his love towards us in, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And also, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. This is what we have to do, to die with Christ day after day to work out salvation. Christ died for, for us, and, and then we should learn how to die daily with Christ. His death brings forgiveness and justification. My daily partaking in his death breaks the power of sin, doubt nature, and his sanctification. So now we'll take them one by one. First, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. Christ died for us. Ro first, sorry, Romans 5, 8. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. No, he, this sorry. is another, uh, oh, another yeah, reference. Okay. Sorry, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Therefore, salvation has been done and completed. And also salvation needs to be worked out. It has been completed by Jesus and I received it as a saving grace. But I need to work it out to receive the Savior as a person lives in me. So please note the following. The sinner has only one gate to enter through, and that is the cross. Another point. However, the believer should know that Jesus has done a lot for us. Jesus has done six main acts of salvation. This is agreed upon from east and west sides. So these are the six main acts of salvation that Jesus has done for us. So thanks God that it is not a matter of controversial talks. However, uh, these six actions are uh, incarnation, incarnation, crucifixion, crucifixion, resurrection, resurrection, ascension, ascension, pouring of the spirit, full, pouring, pouring of the spirit, pouring of the spirit, and his second coming. And his second coming. Justification is once and for all experience, but sanctification is a lifelong process. A steadfast and established spiritual life depends on being rooted in the biblical truth. Therefore, understanding this truth is so fundamental. Now, we died with Christ, the other reference, the other uh, fact. We died with, with Christ. We have another uh, reference from Philippians uh, 12 to 13. You have already heard this, I think. In order to work out our salvation, we need to learn how to constantly and repeatedly draw from the six acts of salvation. Actually, each of these acts has its own grace. The Bible says the grace is manifold. Can you swallow this? So each of the six <laughs> acts of salvation has its own grace. We need to draw from the grace that Jesus has done for us. And the Bible says that this grace is manifold. That means many faceted. First uh, Peter 4.10 As each one has received a gift, a minister uh, uh, gift, minister it to one another as good as stewards of the many for the grace of God. So First Peter 4.10 is where it uses that phrase. And also First Peter 5.10 by but may the God of all grace, but of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after we, you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So now we have these different graces coming from his different actions of redemption. Can I just pause a moment? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think we may have missed, there was a reference, Philippians 2, 12, and 13. He said, oh, you're familiar with that. But that's uh, to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. That was back there. This last reference then was 1 Peter 5, 10. And so now we're going to look at how we receive these special graces constantly and repeatedly. Uh, after a while, just that is the point. Cleansing of the body, of glorification. 
When the redemption work extends to our bodies, this, the results will be cleansing the body from the lusts and unclean desires. And second point, serving the Lord in the way he commands us to do. And again, the resurrection of the bodies in the second coming. These are the, the redemptive works to our bodies. So the redemptive works of cleansing of the body and glorification, cleansing our body from lusts and unclean desires, serving the Lord in the way he commands us to do, and the resurrection of our bodies in the second coming. And we have here some verses from Romans 8, 17, 18, 21, 23, and 30. Romans. Just I'd like to give a comment about the understanding of the, of the early fathers about hearing these verses. Usually we... Okay. Else did, but I, we went from the six saving yes. I, I'm a, right. Where did, could you start again with yeah, sure. I'm going. I, I said that these are the six graces yeah. that we need to receive from them to act, to activate our sanctification. Okay. But I, I I'm going to explain this later on. Okay. I move to the third thing that I said: soul uh, justification, sanctification, and cleansing of the body. Oh, okay. So I came up to the cleansing oh, of the body. Okay. I say the cleansing of the body has three main things. Cleansing the body from lusts and unclean desires. Serving the Lord in the way he commands us to do. And resurrection of the bodies in the second coming. This is the redemptive work of Christ through, through, uh, for our bodies. There are many verses here. We're going to hear them. But uh, I'd like to share with, with you some of the, the understanding of the Irish shares about, uh, about using verses during teaching. Usually... Nowadays, when we, 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 we hear verses just to make the point assured, or, oh, this is, the, this is already in the Bible, thanks God, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it is completely different in the early times. And I continue to teach my people in Egypt this, uh, uh, this point, and it was really wonderful. Their understanding is that when I'm going to read verses, it is not just to be sure that, of course, they, 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 they are very uh, confident in their teachers. Not the case now. But, uh, but they, so they don't find, they are not focused on f hearing what assures the point. No. They are just, once the, the, the word of God is read, they are on their hearts to let it open and receive the life of the word. The life that can enable them to do and live what they have heard. So... And they also read the Bible in a in special way, very quiet, and everyone is concerned. It is now the, the, the main channel of life. Well, we are going to receive the life that enables us to have this cleansing of the body or sanctification or whatever. So. Okay. <clears throat> These scriptures are Romans 8, 17, 18, 21, 23, and 30. So Romans 8, verses 17, 18, 21, 23, and 30. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So you can see this verse speaking about the glorification. Uh, also, there's another verse in First Corinthians 3, 16, 17. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? You yeah. are. And another verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, now we can move actually to the second principle, which is working out of salvation. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm fighting. I'm fighting with the with the with the watch with the time. I, I'm sure we are not going to complete everything during this uh, lecture and the second lecture. I'm just have a suggestion, but I'm submitting it to the leaders that if we can take the afternoon session just to complete something about this process, you can think about it. So now the second principle actually is working out of salvation. It has taken for granted in the early church that every believer needs to be put on spiritual exercise to attain a lifestyle of a spiritual discipline. The early church used to teach every new convert to understand the principle of what is called a spiritual rule. A spiritual rule. It was just assumed every new believer would enter into uh, spiritual exercises. It was taken for granted that every new believer must have a suitable spiritual rule to protect against fluctuation and to acquire commitment and diligence in a spiritual walk. And Philippians 3.16 says, Nevertheless, however, we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And this King King James. And in 2 uh, Timothy 2.5, and also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he com- competes according to the rule. Competes according to the rules. Yeah. But later on, through history, through the history of the church, later on, uh, because of the theological debates between grace, work of the flesh, and possibility of legalism, the church lost such a valuable teaching and experience. A special disciplines usually include, among others, regular prayer, fasting, vigil nights of prayer, so, vigil nights of prayer, uh, prostration, being disciplined and taught by the word of God, receiving spiritual counsel, repentance, searching oneself, obeying the commandment of love and forgiveness, etc. Etc. Yes. <laughs> Of course, it was known that every spiritual discipline one does has a dual action. Uh, this I already referred to, just it's important to uh, read it again. Has dual action, uh, uh, death and resurrection, because it comes us, it connects us with the work of the cross through the Holy Spirit. Thus, it brings to the inner man the power of Christ's death to put the old nature to death, and it brings alongside the power of Christ's resurrection to release the new nature. So the dual action, death, resurrection, crucifixion, resurrection, every spiritual discipline has that at work in it. So this connection with the cross, <laughs> who then can say that this is, this is legalistic? It is synergistic work of the Holy Spirit and the will of man that leads to working out salvation. So the understanding is of a synergistic work of the Holy Spirit and the will of man leading to working out of salvation. Yet we need continuity and the commitment. So this is very important, the consistency, the commitment, that these special disciplines may become life pattern which protects us from slackness, fluctuation, and being taken in by the traps of the devil and the deceitful, deceitful desires of the world. Or you can write them down, some references to read them later. 2 Timothy 2.26. 2 Timothy 2.26. And Ephesians 4.22. Ephesians 4.22. As we continue to follow these spiritual disciplines, we notice that our souls are broadened and sanctified. Our minds are renewed. And the Holy Spirit overflows inside us, filling our vessels, our inner man, with renewed feeling and not just one-off experience of being filled by the Spirit. As a result, we become witnesses for Christ, for the glory of his name and the salvation of the world around. The purpose of the Christian life is the continuous and renewed filling of the Holy Spirit, without which we cannot live a victorious life in the world or serve and witness to those around us. In the book of Acts, 
we read about this renewed feeling in the in the spirit, renewed feeling in the context of the ministry of the apostles. We also read about the re, re, renewed feeling in the rise of the early fathers from the early fourth century, like Saint Anthony and Saint Macarius, and also in the late centuries, like 18th and 19th century, from Saint Seraphim of Seraph. So the purpose of the Christian life is the continued and renewed fillings of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, as disciples of Christ, we need to learn the art of spiritual disciplines, as the early fathers used to use this term, the art of spiritual disciplines, in order to reach the ultimate goal of our Christian life, which is working out our salvation and bearing witness of salvation to others. So the art of spiritual disciplines assist us in working out our salvation and bearing witness of salvation to others. So there are a lot of references that, that should convince anybody that this is very important and is not legalistic. And uh, Paul, who, is, who, spoke, uh, who speaks a lot about grace, also he is the one that speaks a lot about these disciplines. But because of the time, you can write them down, and I hope that you are going to take seriously reading them later on. Philippians 2, 12, 13. Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Philippians 3, 13, and 14. Philippians 3, 13, and 14. First, first Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. First Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. And Second Corinthians 6, 14 to 7, 1. Second Corinthians 6, 14 to to chapter 7, verse 1. We can read these verses. Do you please? Can okay. You? Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And notice that we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. In the meantime, we have the commandment to cleanse ourselves. This is, an word. This is the word of God. This is Paul, not me. And, uh, and I hope that we can also read these ver verses because they are important. Okay, this is... 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Another reference to be written down, you can write again, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. And Colossians 3, 5 to 15. And Colossians 3, 5 to 15. 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. And 1 Timothy 6, 12. 1 Timothy 6, 12. And 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 6. 2 Timothy 2, 3 to 6. Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. Hebrews 4, 9 to 11. We can read this. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example 
of disobedience. Usually I heard many times believers saying, we are in the rest of God, we must not do anything. But Paul says that we are, re- we can, we, let us be, enter this rest with diligence. We cannot le- enter it otherwise. Hebrews 12, 1 to 17. Hebrews 12, 1 to 17. And uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 to 11. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 11. And uh, in this paragraph or this passage, Peter speaks twice about being diligent, again, being diligent in, in a special life. Now purposes, just to finish this uh, hour, uh, the purposes, what are the purposes of these disciplines? I'm sure that you can say, and you have the right to say, you are coming to complicate our spiritual life. <laughs> We're living it very smooth, very wonderful. What all this is? <laughs> yes. But sometimes it is smooth and wonderful, but superficial. Mm. There's a lot of depths that, we, that we have to find out. This is my life during seclusions, of course, and then it tends to be my lifestyle all over my years. Purposes. What are the purposes of, of these disciplines? To nourish our weak spirits so that they can grow, enlarge, and regain, and regain their original shape and role. Another. Let me say it again. To nourish our weak spirits so that they can grow, enlarge, and regain their original shape and role. Next point of the purpose is to release the seed of grace from the inner imprisonment. The, you know, the word, the word, the, yes. To break the barrier yeah. between yeah. spirit and soul, yeah. to release the seed, seed of grace. And uh, finally, to help the process of formation of Christ within us. And Galatians 4.19, Galatians 2.20, you can write them down and have a Galatians look. Galatians 4.19, Galatians 2.20. Now, uh, the first, the, this is the last point. You are going to be released in your break. The practical steps, some practical steps about how to uh, exercise these disciplines. Two main lines, to weaken the old nature, to strengthen the new nature. Now, yeah, Two main things, to weaken the old nature, to strengthen the new nature. This is the purpose of all, we, we do all these disciplines, not just blindly, or just to have wonderful time with God and that's all, but we'll be always living at the surface of the depths of what Christ has achieved for us and he wants us to be Christ-like. But this is the depth that we have to go through. So uh, we, we need to weaken the old nature. We know that this is our problem. And we need to strengthen the new nature. We, we know that we are, this, is our, is, uh, this is our weakness point. Now, the tools that help to weaken the old nature or crucify it, use the t- biblical term, you can fasting on a regular basis, like a day a week, for example. I wonder if we should pause here and come back. What do you think? Okay. But just a very few things, and then I have another four principles. There are a lot, lot of things. Okay, you can choose. It's your time. I think uh, we'll talk about... Finish. Finish? Okay. All right. Now We're the... hungry. <laughs> <laughs> hungry for spiritual food. <laughs> now, the tools that help to weaken the old nature or crucify fasting when regular... Basis Fasting on a regular basis, like a day a week. And the quietness uninterruptedly taken regularly, like periods of, of seclusion, quietness, whatever. Periods of solitude or quietness. Daily repentance is a very important principle in the, in the thinking of the early church. Daily repentance. Reviewing the everyday activity at the end of the day through dialogue with the Holy Spirit. This is really, at the end of the day, I just review what happened during the day and I, am, I call the Holy Spirit to come and help me, speak to me, uh, instruct me, correct me. So it is a very helpful tool for those who are really trained in it. And so that would be like the exam. And is there any way I've brought sadness to your heart yeah. and made you sad today? Or something? And reading in the Word of God, applying one of the ways of reading, namely reading large portions for the main goal of receiving the washing power of the word. Of course, they have a lot of ways how to read the Bible, but this is one of them. So, so yeah. one of the ways of reading the word is to read in large portions, which is like a daily a washing in the word. Uh, n- next point, submitting to God's chastening times, thankfully, trustfully, and cooperatively. Times of failure, confusion, Departing of the Spirit of God, apparently, sickness, misunderstanding, betrayal of friends, financial lack, rejection of others, humiliation. I pass through this, of course, you are not, so 
You may not understand what I'm saying. So submitting to God's chastening times, which can be the circumstances of our life, many different things that are painful, we suffer through, but to submit to them thankfully, trusting, cooperating, uh, yeah. And the last one, sacrificial living, laying down of rights and avoiding materialistic, luxurious life, living. Sacrificial living, yeah. Now the tools that help to strengthen the new man, the new nature, feeding the spirit properly, praying psalms, they call it the manna of the spirit. I like to pause a little, just one minute. Usually they used to pray the book of psalms every day. Uh, uh, the worshippers used to pray the, or the whole book of the psalms every day. But also the believers in the cities usually pray part of it, like the Akbeya. Akbeya is a Coptic word, means the hours, but it is so through all the early church, being with the second century, it was documented the whole believers, east and west, usually pray the book of Psalms, part of it regularly. And they usually prayed it in the way you, 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 we are, you do here, we do here. And they called it the manna of spirits, because some people say that oh, praying everything, the same thing every day, every day, it is some routine prayer. But Israel was supplied or provided by God the manna every day, every day, the same thing. But this manna was able to sustain them, not only physically, but they never lost one single battle during the desert when they were eating this manna. When they entered the, the land and uh, were able to eat everything, they lost many battles. So, uh, so this is a means of strengthening the nude nature. The first one was feeding the, the spirit properly, the Psalms. Reading the Psalms. And, and next point, discerning the need of suitable feeding. There's milk, there's meat. I, I, the father usually can, can help others to, to, to begin with milk and then to proceed to meat. And prostration is worship. The word prostration actually in the Hebrew language, there is no word for worship. It is actually prostrating with forehead to the, forehead, forehead to the ground. Also the Arabic so complete, so, so near to the Hebrew, there is no Arabic word for worship. It is always prostrating down to the, to the ground. So this is prostration worship in Hebrew language, bowing down. Also, unveiled face, as uh, John uh, explained yesterday. Unveiled face is a prayer with prophetic anointing. Uh, the, the verse is 2 Corinthians 3, 18, is written there. So free prayer with prophetic anointing, it comes from 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And stillness, knowing God in stillness. Stillness, knowing God in stillness. We need a lot of stillness. We have a lot of noise. Stillness is another means of strengthening the new nature. And uh, you can write down some verses about stillness. Isaiah 30, 18. And Isaiah 30, verse 18. And Psalm 46, 10. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know I am God. And also uh, Zephaniah 3, I think this may be Zechariah uh, 3.17. Zephaniah 3.17, okay. he will quiet you with his love. And the, and the next point, revelatory reading of the Bible. This is another way they read the Bible. Revelatory reading of the Bible, we first read a lot to get familiar with the word, then study, then afterwards revelation comes. So revelatory reading of the Bible. Um, Reading a lot, that, that was earlier, but studying, being in it, the revelation comes. This happened in my life when I was reading the Bible. I, I read it, I, I memorized it, as I said, and then I was unable to study anything during that time. And then I get familiar with the, the material. So when I began to study, it was so helpful for me because I'm familiar with everything. And then I thought that, oh, everything, now I have every, every answer to any question. Mm -hmm. And then revelation came, oh, this is a completely new thing. The last point is the, the statements of Lord of Jesus and the prophesying statements I shared yesterday with this. We now we can move to the third principle when you come back from the... From so, the, 12 statements of the blood of Jesus, the prophesying statements over the members of the body. He's also found to be a means to strengthen the new, new nature. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Framework on the whiteboard, so we just 
because he's working through a framework, yeah. right? And so we can go, because now we're moving into the third one, so we can just go, this is where we are. Okay, so I don't know who can help me put that framework up, but we'll do that, because I think it will, it, it will help. Well, if they can create a slide, that would be great. But, um, okay, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. So let's go ahead and take our break, and we'll be back at 11, yeah? John, do you have the framework in your mind since you've walked in?